Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Thomas Marx, uh, until recently editor of Apollo magazine, and I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon to host a TAFAF talk in association with Apollo. Uh, TAFAF and Apollo have a long uh, and uh, fertile association with each other, uh, one that has uh, led to a number of events over the years. Uh, and it's a joy to be creating programming with TAFAF uh, alongside TAFAF Online, uh, the second edition of the online fair that continues until Monday and in which some of the world's leading dealers in fine art antiquities over thousands of years worth of artworks are represented uh, in the online platform. Today we're going to be talking about the allure of drawings, uh, the second of three events um, in which we've been exploring the human stories behind museum collections and how the characters and achievements of historical collectors made themselves felt and are being even perhaps reevaluated in museums today. Yesterday, uh, hopefully many of our audience heard about the women who made museums and there'll be a third talk on Monday. But today, drawings that most sometimes considered perhaps the most connoisseurial of fields, almost a specialist field, uh, but and yet a field that makes itself felt across so many other disciplines from painting to sculpture and beyond. And what I was interested in doing in creating the event today was to think about how that expertise, connoisseurship, but also perhaps that obsession that characterizes many uh, collectors of drawings, uh, if not collectors of other objects, is somehow something that perhaps is, or perhaps isn't, transhistorical. So I brought together three speakers who represent institutions with great collections of drawings, but from different time periods and with different focuses. Uh, and we're going to be comparing and contrasting uh, these uh, three great collectors and thinking about their attitudes to collecting drawings, uh, their opportunities for collecting drawings, and indeed where the stimulus came to uh, came came for them in, in bringing that collection to, to the public and preserving its its legacy. So the three speakers we have today are uh, Colin Bailey, director of the Morgan Library and Museum in New York, uh, who is going to be talking about Eugene Thor. I'm going, now I've made a mistake, I'm going in reverse chronological order, but there you go. So I'll continue. Uh, we have Herr Lütchen, who is going to be talking about Fritz Lucht, the founder of the Fondation Custodia in Paris uh, with his wife, Jacoba Kleber. And we have uh, Jacqueline Talman, who is going to be talking about John Guys, if I got this right, Jacqueline, uh, not John Guise, we're not going to say, uh, the collector of drawings whose legacy really created the extraordinary collection that is Christchurch Picture Gallery in, in Oxford. Uh, it's wonderful to have all of you with me. I'm just going to let the uh, audience know that we'll be taking questions throughout uh, this talk. Um, I've asked all of our panelists to talk a little bit about the collector in question and, and how their collecting relates to the subject of the talk. Then we're going to have a, a conversation that's a bit more open and I'll start looking and taking the questions from the audience with about 10 minutes to go, but please do add them in the Q&A box on Zoom all through the event. So I say we should leap in and are we going to, I'm going to ask Jacqueline to tell us about John Guise and his lust for drawings. Let me share the PowerPoint. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to this very illustrious um, event. I'm in Christchurch Library in a place that may have inspired John Guise was a student here to leave his correct collection to Christchurch, as I think, um, and it was housed here for a while. But it's 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 um it's a very important place, and as I think, the ideal place to do this. So um, John Guise here, a posthumous bust of him by John Bacon, was born in Oxford in, as we now know, because his his um, 
birth certificate is, is, is here in the archives on the 16th of October, 1682, and died in London in 1765, and uh, le left his collection of paintings and drawings. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a dual collection, if one wants, to Christchurch, to his former college. He was educated at Christchurch in 1701. He took a BA here, then tried to sort of stay um, in Oxford, to sort of enter academia, applied to for a fellowship at All Souls, uh, as his father had, and um, was rejected, didn't quite know what to do, and entered um, a military career, which was a truly military career. He was um, very much a sort of soldier and rose to general, sort of so General John Guise, and we call him General John Guise, also to distinguish him from all the Johns in the Guise family. Um, Johns and Williams, and one has to just in part. Um, his military career, he was uh, uh, battles at sort of Malplaquet, uh, Cartagena, um, Gibraltar, sort of Jacobite uh, sort of rebellion. He was really everywhere um, until very late in his life. And he seems to have enjoyed warfare. What we know of um, him, or sort of the few letters that we have, are more or less him complaining that the sort of uh, um, soldiers are not looked sort of well after. We have very little about the drawings, but he has this sort of parallel life. He has this sort of parallel uh, sort of side to him sort of to collect and he throughout his life collects. And we know he's then mentioned by George Virtue um, already in 1724, he sort of says, guys has a great collection. The first Duke of Chando sort of writes that, um, oh, there's a case to identify and authenticate a Raphael drawing. And so they ask, if, can we ask guys? He's our man to do that. He advises uh, um, Frederick, Prince of Wales. So he is very much in the milieu. Um, so the, the money, he's not a rich man. So he's one of these sort of middling uh, classes um, who buys. And that makes it also very interesting because the collection itself is one of the very few 18th century collections of this kind. I mean, it's not a royal collection. It's not high aristocracy. It is a collection that usually would have dis been dispersed. And these of 200, uh, 2,000 sheets are now in Christchurch, uh, Christchurch and still intact. So, um, Thomas, could we go through some of the images, please? So I just picked um, a few and, of course, there some highlights. What is interesting about the collection and what I like very much also because it is a university collection and it's very much a teaching collection is that we have also terribly bad drawings amongst them. And to appreciate sort of the Verrocchio here is sort of one of the most sort of stunning Renaissance drawings and sort of the Vasari sheet uh, there with Filippino Lippi, it is always good to see what is not so exciting um, at the time, sort of how one really learned to draw, and then that these are utter masterpieces. Um, what is also interesting with uh, sort of with a very uh, handful of drawings that I sort of selected here: um, uh, Pontormo's depositional lamentation, um, property drawing for the Santa Felicita uh, altarpiece, there Agostino Caracci, um, also a design for um, sort of for sort of something. It's he, what Guy's does, he's, a, he's an intellectual collector, he's a connoisseur, he always tries to connect things. He connects things with something he reads, he's familiar with Vasari, with sort of other writers, and then always sort of tries to connect. Um, it's, it's not a, a lone, a sort of things sort of stand alone. He always, sort of something that you read, an attribution that he thinks he can do through text, which is... Um, I sort of think interesting and also other things that he connects, but I mean, I think we will talk about that later, how he even came to collect and perhaps the final drawing, uh, Thomas, please. Yeah, the Jacob and Rachel, um, very rare sort of sheet by um, Van der Hoes. Um, um, beautiful drawing. He, we're not quite sure if he really knew what it was, but the likelihood that he did is, is high. But again, uh, as a Northern artist that was known, that was written about, I mean, not nothing really obscure. So um, that's the very brief 
sort of overview of, of, of guys. Here, yes, yeah, um, he, he left the collection. This is probably the, um, he left the collection to Christ. This is, uh, and I bore, I think, the world with this, an extraordinary deed. It is an extraordinary event. So in 1765, in 1765, to leave a collection of about 250 paintings and 2,000 drawings to the former college with the idea to create sort of an art museum. I mean, not a museum, the Ashmolean is sort of behind there, but it's a natural history museum, an art museum, and to, to integrate that into the education of Oxford students was groundbreaking. The other interesting thing, of course, is if you are given 2,000 pieces of paper, more or less, and enormous uh, square feet of canvas, you need to put them somewhere so, so that Christchurch then accepts it and puts it in its new library, which was built, and sort of guys then sort of knew that this was built, um, is also quite a feat of, of, um, sort of an idea to really make art accessible to a much wider audience. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm just looking at the Rowlandson uh, caricature. Um, you, you don't have a sharp point, pointer like that to show people drawings anymore, do of you? Of course. I mean, she's my, she's my predecessor. So, so the, <laughs> we sort of look at our profiles. We we're uh, sort of quite, quite sort of similar. So um, um, just the bonnet, I don't quite have. But I mean, the pointer, yeah, electronically. But... <laughs> Um, well, well, thank you for, for the introduction to, to John, guys. Um, I, I, I'm going to move on uh, so that we can have an introduction to all three collectors, but there are certainly points that I'd like to come back to later in the discussion. Um, this sense of the affordability of drawings at different times for different collectors, this sense that for guys, certainly, uh, it sounds like collecting drawings was a quasi-literary pursuit in terms of the relationship to text. And I, I wonder, perhaps that's something that we might find thinking with the, the cataloging instinct of, of Fritz Lucht. Um, so, hey, I'm going to hand over to you now and you will introduce Fritz Lucht to us. Can, can you hear me? Should I unmute? Or... I can hear you. Okay, very good. Yes, uh, Fritz Lucht was born a collector, you could say. I decided to start with this uh, wonderful photograph, uh, still from the 19th century. Lucht was born in Amsterdam in 1884, um, of simple descent. His father was working for the for the community, for the for the town, and uh, he died here in Paris, Place de la Concorde. Uh, with a little bag under his arm filled with, filled with drawings to, to exchange on the 15th of July, 1970, Rembrandt's birthday. And um, we celebrated, we commemorated the 50 years of his death last year. And we once again realized what a, what a special life he has led and how much the art historical world owes to him. He was born a collector. I have two daughters who played restaurant when they were small, Fritz Lucht played a uh, museum. He had a little museum in his bedroom, in, in his house with his parents, and he called it Museum Luchtius in the genitive. And it had a little sign saying, the museum is open whenever the director is at home. Whether somebody told him to do so, or whether it came, I tend to like the idea that it came from him because he was all his life a very witty person. What could you find in that museum? Bullets from the Battle of Waterloo, little shells, uh, things that were related to history. And there's a little catalog that we still cherish here where he also always says the provenance, where it came from, who gave it to him or where he found it. At 14 years old in 1898, there was a Rembrandt exhibition in the Stedelijk Museum, the Museum for Contemporary Art today in Amsterdam. And Lucht went there, 14 years old. It was to inaugurate Queen Wilhelmina. And in that exhibition were paintings. Even the night watch was carried to that museum. But Lucht was taken by the drawings there. He liked to draw himself. And for the first time, there was a large choice of drawings and prints. And he looked at them, was taken by them. And soon after, he went on Saturdays, when there was no school, to the Rijksmuseum 
and he asked for drawings and he came to look at them. He still was sh wearing short pants and the people at the museum said, do your parents know where you are? Oh yeah, sure, they liked the idea of me coming here. He asked for the catalog and there was no catalog. So he decided to make one. So he started with a meter to take the measurements and the size and the technique. And, and that's where a life started, which he never left. So soon after, he decided to write a biography of Rembrandt that was shown to Bredius, then the director of the Maurits House. And he said, you couldn't study art history at that time yet in the Netherlands. And he just said, said, we need people like this young man. And he, uh, he, he, he advised him to start a career with art. At that time, that was only the trade where you could work. And when he was 16, 17, he was taken off school. He never finished his secondary school. And he started, he first he, he stayed in England for half a year, and then he started at an auction house and he made that auction house great. We will hear from Colin that also Eugene Thor was a marchand collectioneur, a dealer collector. And for Fritz Lucht, it's the same thing. He started in the trade in 1915, when the First World War had its effects, the auction house decided to go smaller and he started to uh, act on his own, buying drawings at auction and selling them with a profit. Often his father-in-law would help him by lending him money, borrowing him money, and then he was able to buy things that somebody else could only dream of. And he started to build up his collection. We once found out that until 1970, it took him about 55, 56 years to build up what is in the Fondation Custodia right now. And still every day I am completely baffled by what, by what he was able to, to, to bring together. Uh, can I have the next slide? Yeah. What he, he was a Mennonite, a Protestant. He was not too keen on devotional imagery, on images of martyrdoms and mythological scenes. He, he liked, he was, he was formed in his taste by the school of Barbizon and Impressionism. And he liked images that show real life, landscape, portraits, genre scenes, things like that. Also in his paintings that is visible. And he was uh, yeah, completely into landscape drawing. I think that our collection, the collection that he left behind is the richest in landscapes of the 17th century. It was an encyclopedic collection, but built up with a wonderful eye. I think a key word in his taste is timelessness. This drawing by Willem Buitenweg uh, around 1620 of a ruin out of Rotterdam, I think it has no date. We know where, when it was made, but it could just as well have been made in the 20th century. And that is what he was looking for. Short, to go short, uh, Lucht and his wife, who had five children, they decided to, not to stay in Europe during the war. And in 1940, they went to America and they stayed there for five years. The collection was registered mail, uh, sent to Switzerland, and he and his wife and his children went to Lisbon and then Ellis Island and America. He taught, he gave lectures, he kept on collecting. And he did one thing, he studied how Pierpont Morgan and Frick, how they organized their lives and their collection to stay together and to live on like that. And he came back with his wife in 1945 with the idea in mind to create the equivalent to that, which has become the Fondation Custodia, an endowment. So they put money aside and the revenues from their capital were there to execute the mission and that is to build out and to make the Fondation Custodia a success forever. Um, he built out his taste. Can I have the next slide? And many people associate Lucht with Netherlandish drawings and Rembrandt. We have 21, there are 14 Ruben sheets. But in fact, his taste was much wider. He bought the most fantastic Italian Renaissance drawings when that was still possible. This fantastic drawing for an altarpiece by Andrea del Sarto that is now in Vienna. Again, I use the word timelessness. If you look at this drawing, uh, yeah, you, you ha can hardly believe that you are looking at a drawing that is dated in 1512. It has a sort of modernity to it that is unbelievable. Can I have the next one? 
Here again, a wonderful drawing by Watteau of a man, Persian man, Quacpaillon, and um, also his drawings in the field of French, the French school, are remarkable. He's, he decided to stop in time at around 1800. For him, Ingres and Delacroix were sort of modern artists. And I think because of this um, restriction in his taste and in what he bought, he was able to build up a collection that went so deep. For him, his collection was a building. It was constructed by him and his wife. And he thought that each and every drawing, print, artist letter, painting, were stones that kept that building together. And he was afraid that if his heirs would start to take stones out, the building would start to be wobbly and it would fall down. So the creation of the Fondation Custodia was a very uh, convinced deed. And yeah, he, he asked perennity from his collection. So the three directors that were here since he died, I'm the third one, we are there to, uh, to share his ideal of beauty, his ideal of connoisseurship with the world interested in culture today. Lucht is by far the most often cited art historian in the world. And L is already enough to make reference to his reference works. He was bold enough, audacious enough to start Marc de Collection in 1916. And it was published in 1921. All these collector's marks that are from drawings of prints, you can look them up. The supplement uh, appeared in 1956. And until today, there are three uh, historian, art historians here in the house working to add to that. It's freely accessible online for everybody who's interested by it. There's another standard work that he wrote, Repertoire des Catalogues des Ventes. He decided to make a repertoire, repertoire of all the auction catalogues with what was sold in there. And he was service oriented. He had the conviction that came from his religious belief that we do in life, that we do with the talents that are given to us by the creator, that we have to share that with the community around us. And so also the fact that he gave his collection to be seen and studied by the community came out of that you know, run, well, rather wonderful religious conviction. Thank, thank you very much, Herr. Well, one of the things that interests me about Lucht, I suppose, is uh, is this whether it's a characteristic of people drawn to to works on paper, this sense of uh, completism as a collector, whether connoisseurship and completism are somehow linked together. Certainly, as someone who catalogued all the collector's marks of drawings and prints that he could find, and yet so many drawings are characterized by their freedom and somehow lack of completeness or, or their provisional completeness. And that might be something we come back to. Uh, but you were prompted to mention uh, both Pierpont Morgan and Eugene Thor. And I, I asked Colin to speak not about some of the other collectors who might have uh, be contributed to, to the Morgan Library and Museum, but about, I suppose, the most recent great collector, would you say, Colin, who, who has contributed to the great collection in New York? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Yes, Eugene Victor Thor, Jean Thor. Um, just to remind you that Morgan himself bought Fairfax Murray's drawings in one shot, and that really was his interest in old master drawings. So the Morgan Library, was primarily a collection of books, illuminated manuscripts, literary manuscripts. Uh, that changed, obviously, uh, before Jean appeared. But Jean Thor, Eugene Victor Thor, was born um, on October 27th, 1927. He died on the 8th of January, 2018, just four days before the wonderful show, Drawn to Greatness, that had 150 of his gifts to the Morgan, a, a, gift, a gift that included over 400 works, that, that exhibition was just concluding. He had been involved with the consulting curator, the, the leading curator of the show, Jennifer Tonkovich, the claw, the, the Thor create, uh, curator. He'd been involved with Jennifer in every aspect, selection, layout, book design, essays, we, we all contributed. Um, he was born the son of a heating engineer and a high school teacher in the, in the Bronx. He was a, a, a rather, um, I would say he was rather sort of 
prodigious young man who graduated high school young, entered St. John's College, um, then went on to Columbia University taking graduate classes with Mike Shapiro and um, studying also modern and contemporary art at Betty Parsons Gallery. He may not be well known, but he was the author, co-author of a four volume catalog resume on the work of Jackson Pollock on whom he was an authority. He also gave the artist Joan Mitchell her first one man show. He became interested in uh, active as a dealer in a sort of modest way, encouraged by his wife, who in a way like Luch's wife came from a, 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 a privileged family. And with her, and, and in fact, it was her support also that encouraged him to collect drawings for himself. It's hard to underestimate how powerful Jean was as a dealer, particularly of paintings in the world of Norton Simon, Paul Mellon, the mu great museums. He worked closely with Mario Modestini, the conservator. He had he established enormous trust among the very powerful and, and often very challenging clients that he worked with. Drawings. He loved the Morgan uh, as, as a sort of, in a way, as a repository of creativity and of culture and of learning. Didn't altogether go well when he first offered a gift in the 1960s of a callow that was rebuffed. We don't take gifts from dealers, he was told. On the other hand, he pursued his connection. And also he made a decision uh, in his first exhibition that he, we held in 1975, in 1975, that all of his collection of drawings would come to the Morgan. With Charles Ricecamp, he encouraged the Morgan to open windows. And so until 1974, no work after 1820 was acquired by the Morgan collection. The Morgan had been one of the first museums to have a curator of drawings before the Met, uh, the, the redoubtable Philly Stamphill, but they had not collected 19th and certainly not 20th century drawings. Jean, as, as you know, uh, loved impressionist and symbolist drawings and this led to a new path for the Morgan. If we look at our next slide, um, I want to show you, jumping forward a bit, the drawing that Jean acquired at the Chatsworth sale in, um, 20, um, in, in 2000 in, at Christie's of Rembrandt's uh, Bulwark de Rosa and the Windmill de Schmerport. Uh, excuse my Dutch pronunciation here. Um, and this he paid a record fee for. He paid $3,800,000 for, uh, for, for this. And it added to the collection of Rembrandts that he already had. He had, he's on record as saying, great collecting need not be based on a great fortune. Education, experience, and I are more important. And this is another, in a way, this is something that, that motivated him throughout his collecting. Um, he had certain artists that he loved, just in terms of numbers, I won't, of the 450 odd drawings that he left. Dugar, 14, 14 sheets. Claude, 12 sheets. Cezanne, Delacroix, Fragonard, Rembrandt, Tiepolo, 10 sheets. So he collected certain artists in depth, but he was also ecumenical and he was interested in great masters as well as less well-known artists. He liked, in a way, finished drawings to a degree. If we look at the next drawing, one of uh, a beautiful late a drawing by Bato, 1718, where the young woman is sitting on a daybed, she's almost falling off a daybed, and she's one of, it was this moment when um, Vato with Kailus were renting a studio and renting models in order to, to, to draw the nude in this very relaxed and very modern way, a way that was completely at odds with academic pedagogy at this time, but this is why Vato is so uh, admired. He also added an extraordinary collection of Van Gogh letters because the Morgan, of course, is a museum like the Fondation Custodia that has artists' autographs and, uh, as well as uh, works on paper, as, as well as drawings. And in uh, 2001, he acquired a group of drawings that he gave to the museum in 2007, uh, Van Gogh's letters to Bernard and this marvelous drawing to Gauguin, uh, written from Arles, where he's 
showing him the little bedroom that he wants Gauguin to come and join him in and is saying, this is draw, this is painted, the painting of course is an iconic painting, painted with simplicity a la Seurat. So Jean, um, Jean was responsible for the, the, the great collection that he gave. He was responsible for setting up a conservation studio, the Thor Conservation Center, that was initially um, worked, created by Peggy Ellis, who's the head of conservation of the Institute. He set up the Drawings Institute that exists now and is under John Marchara's leadership, where we have programming and uh, exhibitions and catalogs. He created a, a gallery in honor of his wife, and he created a curatorship uh, in honor of, of, of the family. So his, can, his engagement was profound. He, I would say I, I met him, uh, I'm, I'm the only one lucky enough to know the collector that we're, talk, that, that, that we're talking about today, but I met him first of all in Santa Fe, where I was introduced to him by Charles Reiskamp. Jean was also a great opera lover and supported Glimmerglass in New York. And he um, was, uh, he, he's, quite, he's quite forbidding in some ways. He claimed not to like to give interviews. He's left a very interesting oral history in the archives of American art, but he was, I always sense that he went straight to your, he was interested in you, if you, in you when you were not interested in works of art, seriously interested, knowledgeable in one area or another, and eager to share your enthusiasm and your, and your expertise. He was a great believer in expertise and connoisseurship. And um, in a way, at the end of his life, the issues around Jackson Pollock authenticity was something that he had a very strong opinion on. He wrote, he wrote essays, he was not in any way a scholar like Fritz Lucht, but he wrote a series of essays that were published in the New Criterion in the New York Times. And a, a light motif is how, in a way, how resistant he is for those who see collecting art as a form of investment. For him, it had to be a form of pleasure, enlightenment, and knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. Thank you to all of you for, for introducing uh, these collectors. Um, I, I know none of us are psychologists, uh, but collecting is a, an activity that has often been psychologized. And I, I'm just going to quote a, a line from, from Eugene Thor um, when he wrote once that each collection achieves a personality beyond and apart from the sum of its objects. And this personality is lost if the collection is dispersed or mutilated. And of course, we have three collectors here who, who strive to ensure that their collections stay together as much as possible uh, after their deaths. But I'm interested in that point that Colin makes what observation that, that he's the only one of our speakers who, who knew his collector. And I, I wondered if the other two speakers, uh, perhaps starting with Jacqueline, feel like in some ways at all, they, they know their collector from their collection. I, I'm really interested, Jacqueline, you mentioned to me in an email that you were trying to write uh, not just a biography of uh, guys, but also possibly a novel in, epist in epistolary form, imagining his life and his character. I, I, uh, <laughs> I said, I won't, I will spare the world. But no, it, it, he is an interesting character and sort of every, everything um, sort of one finds, of course one has the impression. It's like um, one lives with the works that these people have collected. I mean, one is very intimate. I mean, drawings are very intimate. Sort of, so they touch them, this whole idea, of course, of our mind. And it's not only the artist, it's also, of course, also sort of the collector. Um, so. Yes, one has the impression, sort of one knows the person, how true that is, is of course a difficult thing. And the, the, the sort of the idea of sort of this duality, especially with guys and being a soldier, I mean, and Walpole writes, I mean, he's also, I mean, he collects in the 18th sort of century, but we have to think it is, it is the early 18th century. I mean, he dies in 1765. So that's way before the French Revolution. That's way before the whole idea of art museums sort of uh, are established. So he he has this sort of um, sort of collection. It is very sort of uh, it is parallel. The only he, one thing also sort of he uh, collects old masters. He does not collect contemporary. He could collect contemporary. There is no uh, guardi. I mean, there is no 
um, sort of very, very little that he would have been able to buy that is here. The only three items that are uh, contemporary are Venetian works. And so there is the, the idea that he, he was, and I sort of think we don't have proof, but I sort of think it is that there is enough evidence that he might have been in Venice. And the one person, um, sort of Venice was a very close society, didn't really welcome foreigners. The only foreigner that was feted at the time in, so Venice was Feldmarschall von, uh, sort of, um, von der Schulenburg, uh, who, a mercenary who had uh, defended Venice. Um, they, it's very likely that they knew each other because they sort of fought at several battles together. And sort of so that he with him then sort of goes through Venice and buys also sort of this um, extraordinary uh, group of drawings that are in Christchurch, the Carlo Ridolfi sort of albums. There are four albums with uh, drawings by Carlo Ridolfi. How does he come to sort of something like that? It's all these sort of things. But then there is... Uh, Robert Adam writes to his brother, um, oh, John Guy's um, has died, and it will be, and he uses the word, it will be dangerous if these drawings are falling in the wrong hands. Why dangerous? I mean, he has also a lot of design drawings. He has a lot of uh, uh, um, sort of ideas. It is absolute, an absolute tr treasure trove of ideas. So that as well, I mean, of course, that feeling for the person, but... Mm, Ja Jacqueline, I, I, I get that. I, I suppose one thing is from the written record, there's some sense of him being, you know, quite a relatively buccaneering character in his military adventures. Uh, and, and I sort of wonder whether, you know, this, this gives you a different sense of the man that, that he could have such care for the detail, the delicacy of, of drawings that were already historical when he bought them. It does. I mean, of course, if you see if if you see the Verrocchio, the head of a sort of woman, I mean, that is sublime. It it can't not sort of touch you. It is difficult to say what sort of how how he felt about that because if you compare, it's sort of slightly compared with the with the paintings. I mean, you you came into his house in Hanover Square in around sort of 1760, and on the one hand was um, a massacre of the innocent life size with 12 people and on the other side was the butcher's shop i mean so it's not sort of something for the faint-hearted whereas drawings are but it is something else um, and i sort of think but i don't want to sort of take all the time it touches very much on his education at christchurch and sort of the idea of collecting and the idea of collecting works on paper one of the one of his teachers was henry aldridge the dean of christchurch at the time and one of the one of the people in Oxford who was really interested in, in the visual, in art. So he collected prints and the print collection uh, was accessible to guys. And so there are a lot of um, talking points. There also, he, he picks up, I mean, there's a there's sort of two woodcuts of an adoration of the shepherd's partition. He tries to get the paintings. There, there, there is sort of another, um, uh, sort of work he knows, he tries to get the preparatory drawing. So, so you have these sort of connection and almost the companionship and camaraderie that you might have on the battlefield, you then have in a different way as scholars sharing drawings, this whole idea of also swapping albums, looking at sort of work sort of together. I sort of think that is sort of something that might have appealed to him a lot, the idea of, of collecting, the idea of having drawings, the idea of people coming to him and he being able to share these wonderful things with other people and being knowledgeable about them. That's very interesting. We sometimes think of collectors, particularly in fields that uh, have that patina of the connoisseurial uh, as being quite solitary individuals, but that idea that there might be a a, a comparable companionship for for someone like guys it, it is intriguing uh, and hey i want to ask you the same question but one thing i just want to add into the mix of it is this idea that i heard all three of you speak and although uh, all three of our collectors uh, gained the opportunity to to acquire drawings and for some of them they were more expensive than others they all had quite modest backgrounds I, and I wondered whether you whether you feel there's something about uh, for someone like looked for for whom 
modesty uh, biographically is somehow tied to to the acquisition of drawings yeah I, th I think so he he was he liked to draw i said it already and perhaps he even dreamt at a certain moment of a, a career as an artist but he saw that that was not in it but he admired uh, what other draftsmen were able of uh, that capable of and i think he was very discreet um, it is true we have the entire archive here he was very prompt in his replies people got an answer and many of these questions are uh, that are posed to him are about attributions and things like that very and uh, so he was seen as somebody who you could turn to for uh, advice and for an attribution and that is, that is true what i think is for lucht and in his life with his drawings he liked to admire and he wrote at one point it's so interesting that you can see where an artist is going to, where he is perhaps uh, trying out something, whether it's for the good or for the bad. He preferred to look over the shoulder of the artist in the process of creating something more so than in the finished project, product. He, he liked that intimacy. There are two key words from the poetry of Constantine Huygens, who was in contact with uh, Rembrandt, amongst others. We have two of the letters that Rembrandt wrote to Constantine Huygens, and there are two uh, concepts in his poetry. One is Ogentroost, the comfort for, of the eyes, and the other is Ogenlust, the lust for the eyes. And I think these are words that come together with him. When, you, when I picture Lucht looking at drawings, it could really be that what he experienced in his life, hardships, things that were not so easy, he could somehow in his dialogue with drawings, by looking at them, he could find ease in that. And the lust for the eyes is really that you admire and that you think, how is it impossible? How is it possible that somebody is able to do that there? That was also very much in him. I, I, I like that. I have to say, I know many artists, I've met many artists in my life. I have an enormous admiration and liking for the people who enjoy the work of others. There are many people who think that they are, you know, autonom autonomous and sovereign and so, but people who look at other people's work and have, have fun in that, I think that is the personification of, of Lucht, to look at the work of others and, and, and admire that and see the, the, the best of it. It's, I mean, it's almost like a, a 19th century definition of sort of a, from a early psychological, writing of, of the concept of sympathy that, that you you can feel yourself uh, you, you, you can approach uh, the, 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 the opportunity and the, the mindset of somebody else even if you cannot enter it or you can approach the skill of somebody else without entering it. Um, I'm interested Colin to, to ask you about there's something that distinguishes I suppose looked in a certain way was uh, collecting groups was quite, um, uh, how should I put it, um, dedicated to, to, to completing certain things. But there is something to say perhaps about Gene Thor that although you mentioned the groups that he had and the collecting in depth, that perhaps a lot of the drawings he collected were about expression, expressiveness. Is, is that fair to say? Um, I, well, not, I mean, they're very powerful, draw, many uh, powerful drawings. Thinking about Lucht as well, and thinking about what Herr was saying, I just it's a, a quote that um, that Jean is quite well known for. He wrote somewhere, "I don't disdain the drawing for the left half of the fresco in the cloister of St Pancras by Jacopo de Petruccini, but I don't care, I don't crave it because of its identification. Most of my drawings turn out to be pictures in themselves. And in a way, he was ref referencing his dear friend and great fellow collector, Janos Scholz, who left all his wonderful drawings, Italian drawings and others to the Morgan, as well as people like the Heinemanns who were collecting in depth, the Tiepolos. But here, Gene is really, you know, he's, he's in, a, in a way reminding us that, most, I think the, the theme for his drawings are often that they are like the autonomous, drawings that became began to be collected in the 18th century 
not so much drawings that would have been perhaps in albums, even although all drawings were until that time, but they are, they have a sort of strength and a presence um, as complete works and, and as sort of masterworks. And I think that is the, that was what drove him. Um, he was he was one of the founders of Master Drawings, the magazine, the journal that still thrives at the Morgan, and he was deeply supportive of scholarship and of attribution, deeply supportive and deeply supportive of understanding how to treat drawings, to restore them, to maintain them. That's why we have the full conservation studio. At the same time, um, and he wrote, he did write, but he was not himself um, uh, devoted to scholarship in the way that Lucht was because he was a full-time active dealer for decades. But there's something there's something to be said here about I, I appreciate what you say about the the work that is a, a thing in itself and and yes great drawing many of us have experienced that that power um, but at the same time the openness the openness of drawings is, is something that we're partly talking about here and by openness I mean at least in part, that all three of these collectors at some point in their life realized that drawings were had an educational potential, were, were the field or one of the fields in which other people would be able to learn. So, I mean, Colin, would you, would you say, I mean, that seems like it's a very strong uh, um, motivation for at least Eugene Thor's gift to the Morgan. Completely, this idea of, in a way, if you're going to train someone to understand drawings and write about drawings and drawings in relation to paintings or to sculpture or to printmaking, you have to have a repository, you have to have access, you have to have curators and conservators, scholarly and proficient who can lead you through. And you have to also have opportunities to compare, to show where you mistakes. I mean, the reattributions, of course. And I think that for him uh, was fundamental and it, the places like the Courtauld and the, and the Fondation Custodia uh, the, and great print rooms in the Ashmolean and the Fitzwilliam, et cetera, and the, and the Getty that was growing. I mean, all of these were examples that he saw, but I think he felt the Morgan was in a way even more fitted to be the repository for this. I'm, I'm going to loop back 250 years, uh, back to, to Christchurch uh, and to guys because, I suppose, I mean, yeah, education was more selective in the 18th century, clearly, and, and uh, fewer people might have had access to the collection. But would you say that is consistent with guys, what Colin has been saying, that, that he had that feeling, he wanted to give the drawings to his college because he saw the, the potential for, for research or for meditative scholarship or or even even simply that they were they were teaching tools. I yes, um, so absolutely, and and I also while he connects the sort of things, I mean, it, it is this sort of idea that you sort of see the poorness of the genius of the idea the the idea yeah. the design that you sort of see there. So, so that is very much sort of there, and yes, it is sort of, it is a tool to. To learn, to learn to see, to learn to appreciate beauty, to to have a different, to use a different sense, to also move somewhat away from the word. Why I sort of say, of course, we're talking about a different time here. Um, so if you don't have imagery, so sort of the imagery you have is not a photograph. You can't sort of look up something. Connoisseurship is sort of something very different. Connoisseurship, you 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 might travel to sort of Italy. You you might sort of have. Um, you know, looked at sort of other sort of other drawings, but it is the memory and it's the word that sort of, that re remains and that you sort of then have. And to tea, to to really introduce the visual, to introduce drawings and to introduce paintings, but drawings sort of probably even more sort of to the curriculum is sort of is sort of something new. And and eventually, I mean, uh, Christchurch then opens up in seventeen. Um, in 1768, um, sort of the gallery, the collection is open to the public, to the public. I mean, not just to the to the students. I mean, it is very deliberate that everyone, um, when the when the director is at home, so to speak, can come and sort of see it. And, and Jacqueline, just um, on the point again to to do that sort of historical flip flop, but 
Eugene Thor, obviously in a very different context uh, of thinking about materiality, uh, clearly cared deeply about conservation. For, for a collector uh, like uh, guys in the 18th century, what, what sort of feel for, obviously he had a feeling for legacy, but, but did he have a feeling for actually materiality in, uh, at, at that point? I, I think that is, that's difficult to say. Um, we also were not quite sure how he arranged his works, but we do have some portfolios and the portfolios are, are also beautiful objects. So materiality, certainly sort of the haptic, the sort of touching sort of something and sort of seeing it and holding it was, I think, something that he was aware of. Conservation, um, not that we know sort of, sort of anything of that. I mean, they were all sort of shoveled sort of together. They sort of were in their original mounts. The paintings were in the, in the frames. They bought, he bought them sort of, so he, he didn't change much. He sort of, he put them in, probably reordered in certain sort of ways, often by size, of course, but it's, it's very difficult to say sort of after, um, sort of for someone like him. I, I must come to the questions of the Q&A, um, but I, I just want to ask one more question uh, of, I, I'm not going to ask it about Eugene Thor because I think it's too early to judge, but for, for the other two collections here, um, in terms of the lives, but also the legacy of these collections, I think it's very clear at the Fondation Custodia that uh, the collection as it existed has led to, uh, has provided pathways for further acquisitions. Uh, that, that's right, isn't it, Herr? I, I just, one thing I found very interesting though was, sure, you, you've bought the landscapes, you've also bought Danish drawings uh, separately, but was that he actually had this collection of Indian miniatures that, that has been grown increasingly uh, in the years after his death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he didn't exclude what his successors would were going to collect. And I think that the Danish drawings came at a moment when it was still possible to buy them. And Lucht started Indian miniatures because Rembrandt liked them. It was a source of inspiration for him. So that was a reason for Lucht to go on. There, there's one link between Eugene Thor and the Fondation Custodia. That's why I regret very much that we didn't see each other and talk about that, is that late in his life, he went to acquire oil sketches and here, as, as a result of a bequest of my three predecessor of a group of some 50 oil sketches, we also did it. I think that simultaneously we realized that that is also work on paper, although with, done with a little limited palette and not with gouache or with watercolor. And it is part of that same group of works. And uh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful to see that we both annexed that as a domain to collecting with drawings as a starting point. Okay, so I'm going to uh, move to some of the questions in the in the Q&A. Um, well, I, I go back because uh, we, we just heard about the portfolios uh, and, uh, and other storage methods at Christchurch. But the question about how looked uh, cared for, stored uh, his collection as, as he acquired works? Were they in flat files? Was he hanging? Was he displaying work? No, in a completely historic way. The, the, the treasury here next door has all these old collector's albums. He hunted his entire life, and we still do today, to these volumes, Rukai, where you put drawings in. We are in the process of, of, uh, of restoring them now. And it is wonderful to see, I think we are one of the few places in the world where all the drawings until 1800 are kept as they always were. He, he was so aware of history. A year before he died, he worked on, a, on an exhibition of the drawings of Pierre-Jean Mariette, by far one of the utmost collectors of drawings in the world. He signs that and he says, "Your." your uh, servant, your great-great-grandson, uh, Fritz Lucht. So he put himself in that tradition. He was traditional in his concepts of life and so on. And also within the collecting, he wanted to keep that very much in line with what he had, with what the study of history had taught him. And, and did he have a, a feel for conservation process in the archiving of his collection? I, and I suppose that must have, if he did, it, perhaps it evolved as conservation practices changed yeah. during his life. He, he, he didn't have a, a, a conservator in, his, in, in the house yet, now we do, but he did 
call on people who also work for other museums and he did and there are 600 old frames that he used to present his drawings in also in exhibitions he wanted them to look as they would have looked in a presentation in the 18th century with mounds and everything um, Co Colin, I suppose Jean Thor was he a collector who displayed his drawings? Um, he did, and in fact, it's it's interesting that what Pierre was saying, uh, Jean was very keen that the drawings that he gives he gave to the Morgan in their frames would remain in their frame, be shown in their frames rather than in standard mat mats and mounts. And he did in his in his townhouse on Park Avenue, which was also his his gallery. There were there. Were, always beautiful drawings on the wall um, and, in, and, and, and on the stairways where there was less light. So yes, he did, he did that. Okay, it's a quick fire round now. There's a question from someone whose surname is either Guise or Guise uh, about collecting drawings. Um, so I want one answer quickly from each of you. Which books on the subject for someone who started collecting drawings would you recommend uh, as an introduction to, to the area? Anyone jump in? Well, perhaps the, the catalog for, for Eugene Thor's Drawn to Greatness uh, or something like that. That. Is, that is very sweet of you. And I, of course, would recommend it because it shows one thing, it does show every drawing in, in beautiful, in, in small illustrations, but they're all shown. And there are essays on every area uh, by specialists. And it's also a pleasure to hold in the hand. Um, so, yes, I would certainly go for that as one of the books you could buy. Um, I, I, I was sort of just thinking there's, there was um, there were very nice uh, proceedings of a symposium about collecting um, um, edited by Chris Baker, my predecessor, and Caroline Elam on, on collecting, because I also sort of saw there's a, a question popping up when, when did collector, collectors mark start and things like that, and there's sort of something very nice also about the Lily collection and um, Sort of other Aldridge sort of collection. I, I think that is a very nice um, um, introduction to things. I, I'm going to give my answer, which is that obviously you can learn these things from books, but you, you can also learn them better in museums and in displays and of course in the rooms of prints and drawings. If you're lucky enough to live anywhere near the British Museum or the Ashmolean or the Fitzwilliam and can book an appointment and have the opportunity to see the sheets yourself and, and to study them, then that is, I think, what a privileged way to learn. But, but those opportunities are there at many museums. And, and auction houses and galleries that you can go in straight. And, and art fairs, Colin. And art, art fairs, fairs, you can go in straight away, you can see things, some things are in, are in, are in boxes and they'll just, you can just look at them. You don't have to make an appointment. So that's another area too. And I, I, I would just jump with Jacqueline. I think I would say, you know, yes, you can read about collecting, but only uh, taking that step if you haven't yet and looking at something and deciding to buy it for yourself and then that will spawn they'll be afraid you'll need it will, will be lonely on its own so there'll have to be others and that i think is how drawings collectors particularly are are, are made um just before we finish i think we have time for one more question uh, so I, I wonder, I mean, it's a question that we have here, and we know that Fritz Lucht was a draftsman, uh, and the question uh, from, uh, is, did any of these collectors have a drawing or painting practice of their own? Um, and I wonder, I wonder if there's just an ex by extension of that. I mean, sometimes you think connoisseurship is, or sometimes the public opinion or, or imagination of connoisseurship is that it's a dusty and specialized and, and as I say, sort of textual pursuit. But, but I wonder if people who draw, it goes back to what we were saying about sympathy, have a hankering for, for the intimacy, the directness of, of the artist's hand. I mean, maybe that's not true in the 18th century, Jacqueline. Maybe it is, we can't say. <laughs> um, guys did draw, and I sort of think that, yes, this, this being very close to, to sort of an object, this sort of uh, directness, he did draw. Um, and um, Aldrich drew and designed. So, so I think I think there is sort of some idea also sort of to learn from, from that, not only to learn to sort of see, but also to learn to make and, and sort of with I mean to educate artists as well sort of to to a certain extent. And I mean I, I remember sort of in Berlin, um, um, sort of as art historians, we had to do drawing classes. I mean, that has something to do to also keep the studio at the Humboldt after the fall of the wall. But I mean, we all had to several drawing classes to learn to see. 
it, it helps, I have to admit, that you know what a piece of chalk does or, or a, a metal point or something. It helps you to understand what the artist was aiming for and what he was doing. Yeah. And Gene, I don't, don't know that Gene Ford was a draftsman, drew or practiced, but what I also, what I want to say is that just his knowledge was not, and love and, and connection with objects was beyond drawings and paintings, and Native American materials, Merovingian jewelry, architectural models, Eurasian bronzes, as well as the, as the, as, as the, as the sketches that, that Cher mentioned. Um, I, I think that somehow that a love of drawing allowed him to also intuit the beauty and skill and interest in a range of this far beyond a European old master modern and modern. And on that note, thinking beyond drawings, and drawings do make us think beyond drawings. Uh, I'm going to end this um, TAFAF talk hosted by Apollo. It, it remains for me just to say thank you very much to our eminent speakers today for a wonderful discussion, to Jacqueline Talman, to Herr Lutchen, and to Colin B. Bailey. Uh, it's been a real pleasure having you uh, with me and sharing your expertise. Um, TAFAF Online continues until Monday the 13th of September, so please do go and check out the more than 700 artworks that are being presented on the online platform. And you can join me on Monday at the same time for a talk with speakers from the Clark Art Institute, the Barnes Foundation and the Collezione Ceruti in Turin talking about the secret sharers. And we'll be thinking about whether the notion of the reclusive collector is as true as it sometimes has been in the popular imagination. So thank you all very much to our audience for coming today. I hope you've enjoyed this event. Thanks everyone.